Ready, let's go to our guest backstage. We go now to Jesse Katz. Jesse, are you with us? Yeah, good morning, Adam. Thanks for having us on. I'm here with my brother, Robert. Hey, Adam. Hey, how you Jesse doing? and Robert. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this. Oh, we're yeah. in, uh, as you can see, it's smoky California right now. It's like we've been sitting next to a, a bonfire with wet logs on it for the past week. <laughs> it's, uh, it just, it burns your eyes, man. It's crazy. California. California, my home state. I've I've moved away from so, so. Uh, whew. Uh, I guess I'm just I'm. It's a it's a really crappy time to be living in the golden state, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be a lot of that going around. It's not just I mean, California. obviously we want to get to your story, and 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 we're gonna take the time to get into the to the the origin of all of this and what you have faced with personal harassment. But I, I can't help myself. I got to talk about this first with what's going on in California. L.A. County just experienced a record heat wave with temperatures of 121. Canceling Halloween because of the coronavirus. Just to be specific for people that don't know the story, they have banned trick-or-treating in L.A. County with COVID as the excuse. And now these wildfires raging out of control with efforts to stop them only hampered by corona lockdown nonsense. Am I am I over or underselling this, guys? Well, I got to tell you that um, we, we've got to admit that, I, I, at least I've got to admit that I'm not exactly up on current events right now because we've been working with such a single-minded focus to keep our heads on our necks right now. So if it doesn't involve a wildfire that is immediately threatening us or our friends or family, or uh, problems that we're having with the county, I'm a little bit out of date. But, uh, I, you know, talking about what's happening to us in the larger context of things, it really is just a microcosm of larger problems. It's it's symptomatic of bigger issues that, you know, you've been you've been talking about for years and years. And that was why I was excited to to have an opportunity to discuss this with you because it scale it scales. The problems that we're having are indicative of the problems that a lot of people are having. Your answer there was so good, it makes me want to cry. By not you. answering my question, you did better than answering my question. I mean, you, really, we are being bullied into isolation. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit that on the first night of the riots, um, you know, the, the BLM movement, I, I was actually up in Oakland, coincidentally, visiting a friend. Um, we were doing some work together, and it wasn't until the following morning that I heard the news of, that, uh, of the federal officer being shot, the security officer. And that was the, really the first time that I, I heard about current events that I would normally otherwise be a lot better informed about. But I'm, I'm only admitting that as an example of just how out of touch I've been recently. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to keep your head on a swivel when we're, we've got so many different things coming at us uh, from different directions, you know, between the wildfires and administrative problems. It just doesn't leave us with a lot of bandwidth. And I think, uh, I think that is, like you've suggested many, many times, it's, it's part of the programming, you know, like keeping us distracted with social issues or, or problems that don't interfere with the business of business, uh, keep us divided and, and from focusing on solving larger issues. Yeah, no, very well said, brother. And I, I can't, I can't fault you for any of that. And I mean, and I, I want to say, could I, could I fault someone who is, you know, uh, who's, who's not suffering, who's not facing challenges like you are, um, but I don't know anybody who isn't, except for people who are working for government right now. The, the only the, who, who aren't part of the system or, or profiteers from it in, in some way. There are very few people who have the luxury of empathizing with people outside of their immediate sphere of suffering. There's an interesting thing there that I'm not normally so... Uh, in touch with, which is government. Unfortunately, I try to keep that contact to a minimum, but <laughs> I've been compelled to interact with government officers uh, way more than I prefer. 
<laughs> and through through the uh, through the pandemic and the shutdown of local government, I've been talking to government officers who are working from home in their homes. Uh, there was one woman that I spoke to who had just gotten back from like Office Depot or one of those box stores where she had to purchase filing cabinets to put in her garage so that she could do her work from home. And these people are, um, you know, they're they're not happy about the situation or circumstances that they're being forced to work through either suboptimal circumstances all the way around and the senselessness of all of it is not lost on everyone. That's a good point. And, and I, I hope that for people like me who might be watching this or listening, you know, I, I, I've often said that, you know, when you become a libertarian and you, you start to see the suffering of other people that you were unaware of before, you have to stop your life and do something about it. You have to pull over like you come to the scene of a car accident as a doctor and you go, oh, shit, you know, I have to help people. And then you see there are a dozen people bleeding out on the side of the road and, and you only have two hands and you can only stop and save one life. And so you stop and you scream for help and you ask people, look, I don't need other doctors. I just need more hands. We just need more people paying attention to stop the bleeding and it's maddening when people just keep driving like yeah, they you don't could say it. you could say the same thing about holding the door for someone you know when does common courtesy turn into the uh the profession of being a doorman you know if you if you stand there holding the door for everyone you're never going to get where you're going and at the same time it's hard to pass people by who are stuck on the side of the road with a broken down car or something but that sort of brings us to the problems that my brother and I have been having because the issues that we run into, uh, they're, they're always because we're just living our lives and then stumble into a problem that we're forced to solve in the moment. And the decisions that we make have this like cascading series of effects on our lives that we're still living with years later. But, um, you know, the, the intent is like not to be activists in the active sense of the word, but when you encounter something that you feel like is is wrong or an injustice on any scale, it's like it's like walking by something on the ground, just pick it up and put it in the trash can, you know? And so we think, hey, we're gonna take a few moments out of our lives to address something that would, an injustice that would be hard to pass by. And it ends up being the diversion that takes our entire lives off course. And this isn't something that we're happy to be dedicating our time to. It's not a, it's not an endeavor that we, you know, that we pursue like a hobby, like a hobby or a career. It's a diversion that we resent. And it's, and it's been a really a painful, a painful experience, but in the scale of things, the problems that we're having, like while they're, you know, it's, it's an example of like larger issues there are so many more so many more and larger issues that people are facing so we try we're trying to keep that in perspective you know being fortunate enough to be in a position to have these kind of problems and and also having um the wherewithal the resources and the and and the skills to to navigate to navigate these obstacles because the administrative and bureaucratic processes um are impossible impossible yeah. for for people well, the point I was making is that when we are we we are desperately calling for help as as activists to address the injustices of of the world, and it's easy to resent people who decline to help. And I think the way you answered that question is really important for us to keep in mind that element of of sympathy for for people who can't help because. They're all struggling with their own injustices right now. But Robert, Jesse, if you could, you know, what is this a diversion from? Please go back to the beginning when, when you, you bought 40 acres near Santa Cruz in 2016. Uh, what led you to that decision and, and what was your intent with the property? Well, we, my brother and I work as, as engineers, uh, product designers, industrial, industrial designers, that type of thing. And so we, we were really interested, getting more and more interested as we got older in the idea of applying our skills and our experience to new projects, new challenges. And so we were, we were really interested in working on the idea of, of starting a farm, some agricultural endeavors out in the, out in the hills surrounding our hometown um, and applying our experience to this new project. So in 2016, we purchased this, this property with a close, cl close friend of ours 
And we took possession of the property early uh, because there was no reason that it wasn't going to, you know, escrow wasn't going to close. We didn't anticipate any problems. But on the day we were supposed to close escrow, uh, the, the, the Loma fire broke out. And this was 20, the massive fires of 2016 in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Now, we had already, like I said, taken possession of the property and moved all of our equipment out here. Our life savings, all of, our, all of the resources that we'd accumulated to start an, an off-grid endeavor of really ambitious proportions. So quite a bit of equipment and, and things that we had brought up here to do this. When that fire started, it threatened everything. And the very first day, like before we even got out of the starting gate, it, it looked like it was all over. And the actions that we took from that moment forward uh, just just changed the course of everything that we've done that we've done here since and had to and had to endure. So just to go back for a second, your your work in uh, design and engineering was focused on outdoor sports, off road motorsports. Uh, and and you wanted to take those skills to apply to to farming. Can you yeah. can you be a little more specific with both of those? Because I mean I'm yeah absolutely uh, they're both cool exciting topics, but also it's yeah. a very interesting concept that, that, that you're kind of selling yourself short on of taking this expertise and applying it to something where there is a a huge opportunity to really move humanity forward with a little application of technology and food production, right? So. Yeah, it's it's been it's been really fun for us to pursue this from this perspective, which is which is unique. And it's not that we're bringing any new insights or experience to agriculture. We're not experts in any of the areas that we are endeavoring right now. It's more that from the perspective of people that take a mechanical approach to problem solving, um, we're not doing we're not doing a. Uh, you know, b clearing brush with goats, you know, we're building excavators with masticating heads and adapting mechanical things from military surplus and junkyards and rebuilding things. So what I, what, the reason why I start this conversation that way is to say that like, this is a highly mechanized experimental endeavor that we're, we're building and modifying and adapting the tools that we're, that we're creating to these purposes. And it looks unusual. And that is the root of a lot of the problems that we're having at this property because it doesn't look typical of, of, a, of a farming operation. All right, I got to challenge you on one thing. Having lived in California and having bought land myself and decided I'm not going to do it in California, why? I mean, you know, like it's not like you had never heard of the California state government and the evil yeah. that it's capable of before you bought the land. Why, why did you have to do it there instead of somewhere really, uh, you know, a lot more rural or out of the way yeah. or with a, a friendlier regulatory zoning kind of environment like we have here in northern Arizona? Yeah, I think a lot of that kind of ties in with our family. You know, we, we grew up in this town. We're hometown kids. Um, so we have that connection here. But um, like a larger part of our interest in that regard is we're trying to approach this this agriculture from a new perspective where Conventional farming in this valley is dead. Um, farms are going out of business left and right, and it's directly tied to the increasing cost of land. So farm labor is no longer available to manage these crops. So, you know, laborers are being driven over from re real, real far away in the Central Valley. You know, they're taking hours out of their day just in, in commutes. So that that ruins the economy of conventional farming in this area. And if we're able to succeed in the way we plan and hope, it's going to preserve some of that rural nature um, and that aesthetic in, in an area we love. It's really important to add there that for people who have not been to this California and don't know the history of it, this is this is arguably the most fertile farmland in all of the lower 48 United States. And it's paved under as Silicon Valley has has driven the real estate prices mm. through the roof. But when when we were growing up here, I, I was a child of the 80s. I mean, people rode their horses on the streets, unironically, to the local saloon where they tie them up out front. And I mean, it was it was ag town, like like what you'd imagine in the heartland of middle middle America. And so, as things have changed, like the lifestyle that we pursue, like our pursuit of happiness, looks out of place in this area. But it's just it's a throwback to an to another to another time that um, we've been outpaced by the growth of the local economy and pushed out to the margins. So some of the problems that we're having are, are directly related to the fact that we're doing it out in the hills of the Santa Cruz Mountains, where land is less expensive. It's incredibly rugged. Like you wouldn't choose 
to pursue what we're doing here, it's not your first choice. It's all, it's literally all that's left. So there's a, there's an intrinsic value to us in doing this in an area where it, these forests have burned and burned and been left untended and mismanaged. And so being able to rehabilitate and revitalize the forest mm -hmm. around here is sort of a, it's an end in itself, a worthwhile, a worthwhile pursuit to us. So being able to, to do this forest work, rehabilitate the forest, and mm. then and then mix in these other complementary uses is something that that really has a lot of meaning to us. And like you, I left California more than once. And I keep coming back because what I find is that other, like I've been fortunate enough to always live in vacation destinations, places on the West Coast that people come from all over the world to see. And <clears throat> And I keep coming back here because what I realize is that all of the other states, anywhere that I want to be, other places that I visited, they're only a number of years behind California. So you might as well right. make a stand where you want, wherever you want to call home. All right. Uh, that solid reasoning. Sounds like it to me. Uh, I, I don't want to get sidetracked with this too long, but uh, is this at all connected to the California water crisis? Uh, I I can't say I can't say no, and one of the main reasons for that is that we have riparian, deeded riparian rights to the creek adjacent to our property, and riparian rights are really interesting because water rights in general in California, California never really created like a comprehensive body of laws to govern water rights. Like when when a lot of states were started or when they were incorporated, they they would le legislators would come together and say this is how we're going to regulate these resources and in california um it was gangster all the way there's a really good book called cadillac desert that that chronicles the history of water rights and uh and and how how water is prioritized throughout the state and it reads like uh it, it reads like a soap op like a soap opera novel you know like murder bribery corruption all the way through and so most of the water rights are appropriated and litigated to the most expensive outcomes. And so one of the reasons we purchased this property is because of the deeded riparian water rights that we have. And our first serious contact with law enforcement was was over was happened while I was drawing water from that creek. And so that that has been a point that has been contested ever since. And instead of when I showed them, I, when I showed them the de our deeded rights, instead of challenging those um, or prosecuting us for a crime, they just shift gears to other enforcement mechanisms, and that's when the code enforcement problems started. Yeah. So let's let's go back and and see if you can just answer directly. How did all of this lead to Santa Clara County now threatening to seize the property? Well, we've tried to participate in the process to the degree that we've been allowed. Um, the problem is that we have been railroaded to one specific outcome, which is compliance on their terms and nothing less than a nothing less than a hundred percent. So, if we challenge uh, the validity or the merit of any of these violations or the mechanisms that they're in using to enforce them, which have been misapplied and misinterpreted deliberately to have this intended effect, um, they're, they're using these things like uh, sort of like a criminal plea deal where they will stack up these, alle these allegations and then use them as negotiating tools to say, well, if you agree to do all of these things, we'll take away the most serious violations. And, and that's it. So it's not a negotiation. The the only choice we're it's giving is the method of execution. No, this is this is like a typical law enforcement in any kind of criminal proceeding. Throw a bunch of charges at someone, and yeah, use that as leverage to get them to take a plea on on a lesser charge or to submit. That's but this exactly. is this is connected also to the civil rights advocacy that you did, how did the ACLU get involved? Can, uh, maybe you got to start back somewhere to explain that, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, in, 20, in 2015, uh, my brother, he's 10 years younger than me, and Rob had just graduated from college, really good kid. He'd never had any kind of contact with law enforcement. And we were eating burritos in a taqueria in Barstow, unfortunately. We were just passing through, but we had been working on heavy equipment all day, had some mechanical problems. We had to lay over there for the night. And so we, we looked like dirt bags, you know, greasy, scummy, tired at the end of a long day. 
and uh, law enforcement came into this taqueria to investigate allegations that a customer had made about someone stealing a vape pen. And the officers approached us first. I didn't know if that was intentional, but they just asked, hey, what's going on here? And I just told them, hey, this guy's he kind of he was behaving like a tweaker, you know, just like really erratic, speedy behavior. And he was he was alleging that these ladies behind the counter had stolen his vape pen. And I just told him, like, we've been here nothing happened. Didn't see anything. This is a non event. And they said, that's fine, boys, but we're going to need to see some ID. And that's when we pushed back. So um, at those points of contact, like that's usually the approach that I'll take is to respectfully decline to participate to whatever degree I'm allowed uh, to maintain my privacy and just to 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 stay out of those kind of interactions. But because of because of my brother Rob's, uh, you know, like innocence in that respect, I, I gave him the option. I'm like, look, we could just show these guys ID and call it a day. But things are going to escalate if we push back because they weren't having it. It stopped being about the investigation of any alleged crime, a vape pen that was missing. Uh, and, and immediately it was about a bigger issue, which was us challenging their authority. And, you know, Rob just, it was the first time that he said, you know, like he'd never experienced anything like that. He said, this isn't right. We should, we should push back on it. And so we ended up getting arrested, spent the next year being prosecuted. They were pushing for jail time. They really wanted to make an example out of us. And so the ACLU ended up representing us. And, the, and our goal with that was to reach a settlement that included mandatory civil rights training for all of the officers in that county. And so ultimately, Barstow offered us a settlement. And we were negotiating over the price of the cash settlement versus these other things that were more important to us. So we negotiated a lower cash settlement in order in order that they had to agree to do to to give all of their officers this mandatory civil rights training which we got to co-author with this with the ACLU and the effect that that had was that it makes the entire department and county mechanism culpable in the actions of bad actors so they can't any longer claim oh that's just a bad that's just a bad apple that's just a bad cop and immediately after we reached this settlement there was a woman who was a pregnant woman who was body slammed in the school parking lot by an officer who was investigating a claim by someone else that this lady had backed into her car. You know, so it's the escalation of that kind of violence that this had a direct effect on. And that was really the only outcome for us because we were in the, we were in the position of, of being forced to, to empathize and sympathize with, with disadvantaged classes of people who are preyed upon by law enforcement in in ways that we don't normally have to experience um and we had an opportunity to do something about it and that led to this series of events where ever since that time we've had contact with law enforcement that has escalated to the point where local we'd never had any kind of previous problems with law enforcement but local law enforcement made us aware that they knew what had happened in barstow and ultimately i ended up getting so I was sought out by law enforcement and arrested for the exact same thing in Morgan Hill, where I successfully defended myself against those criminal charges because I'd already been through it with the ACLU. What were the actual charges? It's always just PC 148. And so there's no there's no underlying charges. It's just resisting, delaying or obstructing an officer in the course of their duties, which is illegal. It's unconstitutional okay. in the state of California. You can't arrest someone for resisting arrest if there's no underlying charges. But to bring this to, to bring this to the point of how it applies to our property, this is not conspiratorial in the sense that we're like trying to connect things on a, you know, on a conspiratorial like Right. You have email proof of the officers actually saying some the officers actually directly. admitted. this. Yeah. So um, on the day on the day that I first spoke to the district attorney about the criminal charges that they were trying to prosecute me for for resisting arrest in Morgan Hill. Um, immediately, as the district attorney became aware of what of, of what he was facing, what he was going to have to push forward and the burden that he was presented with, um, he dropped it like a hot potato. And within two or three hours on the exact same day, a sheriff showed up at my house, our property, for the first time. And he had to trespass onto this property to accost me at the creek and start demanding, harassing, uh, harassing me and demanding, among other things, identification. So it's been made explicitly clear to us why we're having these problems, even to the extent that when a local paper, the Morgan Hill Times, wrote an article about what was happening to us, uh, there was a senior officer who in, during this interview with the Morgan Hill Times, 
uh, mentioned of his own accord an email that he had authored and distributed to all sworn officers in in the in this in this area. Um, my brother and I were the subject of this email, and it declared us to be a threat to law enforcement and a danger to the community. And when the editor of this paper, Michael Moore, asked asked why that was, if we had any criminal history or if they had any reason to suspect us of of some kind of criminal intent or 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 danger, um, that officer actually cited. Barstow and the ACLU as the primary reason for their prejudice against us. And wow. even when asked a clarifying question, they doubled down on that. And that just kind of speaks to the level of it, it's it's just so tone, it's so tone deaf. Like there's not even an attempt to disguise to disguise to disguise it. There's zero fear of accountability. And that's been the same, you know, the county has followed through with code enforcement in exactly the same manner. So where do you stand now with the property and charges? So on August 7th of 2020, we were, we, that was a deadline to basically, there was an, a sign or seizure ultimatum. Either you sign this compliance agreement, which is the equivalent of a criminal plea deal, which would bind us to all the terms of this contract that we would have entered into voluntarily, um, forfeiting yeah, I got all one of those three, by the way. It was a, yeah. a, not 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 exactly the same legal mechanism, but it was county code enforcement. Well, we'll we'll back off with these hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines we're threatening you with. Like uh, for me, it was obviously different circumstances, but it was uh, camping on your own land for more than 10 consecutive days or yeah. 30 cumulative days in a year is a violation. And every day a violation is you know, several hundred dollars in fines. And, and it was like, all right, well, so we, you know, we're going to steal everything you own or you can sign this and promise to bring your property into compliance. Adam, in this case, in this case, this is an example of how bad it is. We were, we were, the county issued violations for environmental hazards that carried fines of up to $37,500 per, per day per violation. So yeah. we could have yeah. been facing hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines per day. And yeah. the enforcement mechanism, the, the regulations stipulate that if, if violations like that serious are alleged by the county, they have a responsibility to tell us where the violations are, what step, what actions we have to take to correct them, and a timeline to correct those violations. So we've been 100% responsive and cooperative about all of throughout this entire process. And when I was speaking to the senior grading official immediately after receiving this notification, he clarified that the county had not seen anything that would indicate that there were ever any of those kind of violations on the property. There was no evidence to suggest that there had ever been any kind of environmental hazards on the property, which confused me. But I found out shortly after, as soon as the county council offered us this compliance agreement, that was the very first thing during the process of negotiating the terms of this agreement that they offered to drop, which is curious because if you think about it, if a violation is serious enough to carry that type of fine, it is, it's because we're trying to discourage people from mismanaging or abusing natural resources, right? We live in a, th this property is in a watershed. It flows downhill to Uvis Creek. It, it feeds a reservoir. It's incredibly important. Like um, if, if those kind of abuses were happening, like maybe, maybe outrageous fines are appropriate. But to see that there's no evidence of those violations and the county issued them anyway, and then they offered as the very first point in negotiations to strike those violations from the agreement, not just the fines, not just the fees, but they're saying, oh, those violations don't exist, so we won't fine you for them if you sign this agreement. If the violations were that serious in the first place, wouldn't they need to be addressed? Wouldn't that be criminal to let them continue unabated if, if they ever existed? That's just sort of indicative of, of how the entire mechanism works. It's a it's a it's a revenue machine. Yep. There you go. I thought for a second there you were missing the point of government. But yeah, <laughs> you gotta stop asking those naive questions when you know that truth. That like this is why it works the way it is. This is why it's set up this way. So you declined to sign the agreement for uh -huh. on, on August 7th, and you're in negotiation still. Is that Negotiations right? are negotiations are over. We declined to sign the agreement. That was what the county termed their final offer. 
and they made clear that their next steps would be to to seek a, what's called a temporary restraining order from a judge, which would essentially ban my brother and I from this property. And ultimately, the county would seek to have it turned over into what they call a receivership, which would be a third party that they contract to abate the violations at our expense. And the violations that they're alleging, they can execute and abate any way they want. So those violations could easily and almost immediately exceed the value of the property. So when we decline or, or if we're unable or unwilling to pay for the cost of abating those violations, our property is then sold uh, to, to, pay the, to pay their fines and fees. So, so we're, gonna... threat, we're, we're facing the threat, uh, an imminent threat of seizure right now. And it's, it's, we've had to adopt something like uh, an administrative siege mentality. You know, we're, we are trying to defend ourselves in every way that we can from, from threats that include, you know, natural disasters like wildfires and administrative seizures by police force. It's, so, they it's can send you, so they could send you a notice tomorrow. Fuck you. You're out of here. 24 hours notice. Oh, 20. Oh, that isn't that courteous of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what would you do with that? If that happened? I can't, can't really say as we, you know, there's, there's pen, there's litigation pending and we have to consider that the County is very aware of like our social media presence and our activities online. So we, we do have to be cautious about, um, declaring, declaring intent. Um, as far as how we would respond to certain things, because we've already seen that when we engage with the county in good faith and talk to them about our intent for the property and the reasons why we're engaged in certain activities or doing the things that we're doing, um, we've seen them change tactics through their enforcement process so that they're reacting to our defenses and come back at us with a new offense that takes that into consideration. So what I need to be clear about is that we we don't position ourselves for anything like uh, you know a Bundy Ranch type of standoff. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking to raise to start any type of an armed insurrection. And that is one of the county's biggest concerns is that because a lot of our equipment comes from military surplus. Um, one of the reasons they're trying to seize our property is because they they said that we are operating an unpermit. We, they said that we were advertising an unpermitted survivalist retreat on Airbnb. Yeah, when in fact the only thing that we've ever advertised on Airbnb and everywhere else on social media is that whenever there's any type of natural disaster, my brother and I are really well prepared to to respond to those things. So we use our heavy equipment to evacuate people, animals, haul supplies through those types of emergencies. And what we've done is that on Airbnb and Hip Camp and a few other places, they'll offer like special sections of their websites where people can open their homes to host people for free. And that's what we've done. So you, you can see how they've deliberately misinterpreted and projected their fears upon us thinking that we're some type of like militant, you know, like mi militant, like sovereign citizen type type of people, instead of just reading the plain meaning of words when and taking it at face value that we're saying we're doing what we're saying, which is just trying to help ourselves and our communities like stay safe, make it through these like difficult times, you know, and this, this goes back to 2016, 2017, when we first started having some of those raging wildfires that were affecting people broadly across Northern California. After, after we were lucky enough by circumstances and the hard work of Cal Fire to make it through that first fire unscathed, we were left in a position to be able to offer people more than hopes and prayers. So that's what we've, that's what we've done and we continue to do. We just got back from Bonnie Dune where we helped a friend defend his home and his entire neighborhood. You know, we saved an entire small community of homes from wildfires that devoured the surrounding areas. And the only reason we were able to do that is because of the equipment that we inventory here that includes fire trucks and water trucks and things that we could only conceivably use for these purposes. There's no, there's no other application for them, commercial or otherwise, and the county won't allow for that as a reasonable defense when it seems to us like sort of like the second amendment ensures our our right to self defense among other things we are defending ourselves from more imminent threats than that kind of violence you know a fire truck is 
the most necessary thing we have right now to secure our safety and our property. And we were just forced to sell one of our two fire trucks to pay our legal bills last month. And being unable to bring more resources to a place like Bonnie Dune, where we were able to make such a difference with one fire truck, it brought me to tears to see to see what was happening and know what we could have done with more resources. I, we're just, you know, heartbroken. We're heartbroken about not being able to put our time and resources to towards more productive uses. Do the people you're dealing with just not have any shame? Couldn't answer that. They say that it, they, they've actually said to us that intent doesn't matter when it comes to enforcing, interpreting, enforcing regulations. And that seems to be tr equally true the other way around. Um, they just they don't seem to care about our intent and the fact that we've been 100 percent consistent between what we're saying and what we're doing. You know, we've had this property for close to four years now. And if there was anything illegal or nefarious happening, we'd have done it by now. There would be some evidence of some wrongdoing when, in fact, it's like, what what's the conceivable use for a fire truck other than fighting fires? I just don't I don't I don't see it and they won't make allowances for it when at the same time they're in the process of rewriting their regulations regarding rural properties. And as the as the primary motivation for for why this is necessary, they cite reducing the cost of providing emergency and municipal services to the unincorporated parts of Santa Clara County as the reason for doing this when in response to that, I'm saying, great, let us take care of ourselves. I understand that like you're not we're not generating enough tax revenue for you to provide these services as a business model, but then alternately, at least let us provide for ourselves and our communities. And this is not like a case of vigilante firefighting, you know, like we're working directly, very closely with Cal Fire and our local volunteer fire department. But one of the things, one of the biggest violations we're facing right now is the county has, has cited us for grading an emergency helicopter landing pad for Cal Fire, for Cal Fire, which we did during the Loma Fire in 2016. So during that wildfire, we did a lot of emergency dirt work that included this massive helicopter landing pad. And Cal Fire is telling the county, yes, we authorize them to do that. We're working directly with them for, on, on all of these areas. And the county is saying, we don't care. You didn't get our blessing. They wanted us to, to stop what we were doing during a wildfire, go down to the county offices and apply for an emergency permit, which could take 48 hours for them to even respond to. Like the senselessness of that is beyond anything I would have thought possible. So, Jesse, Robert, you've got to be going through so many different emotions and 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 considering so many different ways to approach this in your own situation. And you know, my heart goes out to you because I I, I do know what that's like. I, I really do relate to being in a, a kind of intractable situation with government officials who just have it out for you personally because you challenge their authority in some way. And in, in my case, in the county here, uh, we won, uh, at least in a standoff kind of way where we wanted to be left alone. They left us alone. We didn't have to pay anything. I, I had to deal with a lot of bullshit and waste a lot of time telling these bullies to go away myself. But, um, you know, relatively positive outcome congratulations I, yeah no i, I appreciate I, that it, i was excited like, uh, when you i was i was follow i was following a lot of a lot of your your content when you were when you were started pursuing the freedom farm and i i did send you an email at that time to i invited you out to come visit us because we've we've got a lot of parallel interests there and you know the autonomy that we're able to you know we're able to be a little bit more self-sufficient to any de to any degree is something that we're uh, pursuing passionately. And to see you taking a similar approach to that um, is, you know, revolutionary agriculture, you know, it's yeah. like that, yeah. that, that is, uh, that's really central to our pursuits. And it's exciting to see you um, take it, taking that approach and, and an interest in, in those things as well, because you bring it to a much wider audience. So how do you think your case is going to play out and what do you hope? to happen 
I think you know what we hope, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the delta the delta between best case worst case couldn't be wider right now. We're facing either we're facing either the loss of our entire life savings, life work. Um, everything is everything is invested here in this property. There's no backup plan. There's no safety net. Um, we have to make this work, and I think that in that way. Um, we have the resolve of an invaded army because this is our only this is our only priority. If they take this away from us, we it's a it, it's a bottomless chasm. There's there's nothing below us, and so um, as hard as we've worked to accomplish everything that we're so proud of to have accomplished by this point in our lives, I'm not going to let go of that without a fight. So. Uh, I, I I jokingly refer to this as an administrative jihad. If we're facing if we're facing on the one hand the threat of losing everything by by signing a compliance agreement that um, that castrates us to such an extent that we would we would diminish the beneficial use of this property to near zero and face bankruptcy because the cost of abating these violations per their terms are it's it's untenable it's impossible so if we face a a, sh a certain failure taking that path our only alternative is to is to pursue is to pursue this and see it all the way through and in that way at least we have the benefit of we can be certain that there's no room for regrets you know um we have participated in the process to the degree that we're able and we're going to continue. We're going to continue to do that. But at this point, the county has is refusing to even respond to our lawyers. I mean, we have a great land use attorney, uh, Donald Sobelman, who's been representing us, and he's a very competent lawyer. This is not a case of two hillbillies yelling at the county, waving their fists defiantly, screaming about their rights. I mean, we are a hundred percent right about a hundred percent of these issues, and the county actually refuses to acknowledge the merits of any of our arguments. What they've done instead is they've lied about, outright lied, we've caught them lying about the service of notices that they use as the basis to say that we failed to avail ourselves of administrative remedies in a timely manner. And so what they're doing is they're seeking summary judgment by saying whether or not any of these violations exist doesn't matter anymore because the mechanism, the mechanism is moving forward. And because, because you didn't respond in time, you've lost, you forfeited the right to do that. And when confronted with the facts that we have kept meticulous records, and when we have showed the county, the only empirical evidence that we have of contact from you shows that we did not receive these messages. And the county refuses to show us any evidence that these notices were ever issued. That's really suspect. That's really concerning that the thing that they're using as the basis for the seizure in order to prohibit us from participating in the process, that they refuse to show us the evidence of that is outrageous because I offered my head on a silver platter. I told them I will always leave room for the possibility that I'm mistaken. If I'm incorrect, if I've been negligent in not responding to any notices, that's on me. Show me that that is true and this all ends right now. And they declined to do that, which is which is curious, isn't it? Nope. Sadly, typical. Tragically typical. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I, the, the last question I, I, I want to ask is then stepping stepping back to look at the bigger picture beyond your own situation. What do you think is the priority for government reform? And I know that's almost a pathetic compromise, but what would you want to see changed in, in, a, in a bigger policy sense to ensure that county governments can't keep harassing people like this? It's really it's really simple, Adam. In this case, it's not that we need to change the rules. The rules are already incredibly permissive towards agriculture because sort of like how the Internet is still being regulated uh, from the telecom era the rules, the regulations in place were written in an era when agriculture was incredibly influential in this area. And so everything that we're doing is allowed 100% by right, meaning that we should not have to apply for any discretionary permits or, or go through any per discretionary permitting processes. 
And that's, that's something that we've done very deliberately is to structure and restrict our activities to those things that are uh, allowed by right, by the existing regulations to the maximum extent possible. And th that is something that it's like, it's not acceptable to the county that that is actually allowed that's what the rules say. So we're not we're not even advocating to change the rules or saying that the rules aren't fair and we should be allowed to do something that is that is not expressly allowed. It's that right. it's only that the county should have to acknowledge and enforce the rules as they are as they are written. So it sounds like your county government has been taken over by criminals. Literally. Yeah. Literally, uh, the code enforcement officer that we first had contact with, for instance, is allegedly a disgraced former police officer who was caught running a chop shop selling stolen engines. And then while he was still on probation for these felonies, he was employed by a code, as a code enforcement officer by Santa Clara County. These are the kind of people that the county employs to take these actions against us. Yeah. This is all public record. It's not conspiratorial. It's it's just historical fact. Are you guys going to be running for uh, county council or, or or something like that then to to clean no up this record? <laughs> no, the the supervi supervisor Wasserman on the board of directors for our county right now, and the sheriff Lori Smith are both being investigated for bribery right now, and so Lori Smith just <laughs> she she pled the fifth to avoid implicating herself in crimes. The highest ranking law enforcement officer in Santa Clara County had to plead the fifth to avoid incriminating herself in crimes. And Supervisor Wasserman actually cited memory problems that are so severe that as an example of how bad this is, he said, I know I've been to Spain, but I couldn't tell you if it was with as a child with my parents or if I took my children as an adult. And either he's lying or he's unfit for office, but how you could say something like that with a straight face, I could never participate in, in government with those people. I just, I can't personally. Well, hopefully their time in office is very limited at this point and some mechanism of government will hold those particular individuals accountable, but uh, I, w I certainly would never rely on government to hold itself accountable. And I, I think uh, the people of, of the county need to start paying attention. I hope they learn from your story. So Jim threw up a, a comment here. He wants us to share. Uh, Mary Wildfire says, good for you. Fight back and keep doing what you do. Sounds like you're amazing people. Best wishes. I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for that okay. comment, Mary. Uh, guys, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Do you have, is there anything in, our, in your story that, that, that we haven't covered or that, that you need to include here? And, there's and so how much. can people connect with you? There's, there's so much we could get into, but I think this, is, this has been a really good summary of the situation just to make people aware of what's happening to us and most importantly, how these, what, what the broader implications are. You know, And that's really the issue is that just like with Barstow and the ACLU, if we prevail here, there are broader implications that everyone ought to be allowed to do the things that my brother and I are pursuing according to the existing rules. You know, the things that we are trying to do are not unreasonable. And instead of focusing on any of the specific violations, the alleged violations the county is, is levied against us, we're trying to call attention to the abuse of power and process that is to the extent that they're refusing to give us due process to participate in the process. Even a murderer gets a trial and we are being kept out of a system that has only one outcome from their perspective. And, and that's what we're trying to call attention to. So we appreciate you having us on to talk about this. We've got a petition on change.org. Maybe we could provide a link to, um, but, but really we're just trying to get the word out that these kind of abuses are occurring because it is civil asset forfeiture type of fuckery on a scale larger than I could have imagined. There's no, there's no crimes alleged or being committed. We don't owe anybody money. There's no back taxes. There's no reason for this to be happening other than what we've talked about, unfortunately. Thank so you again. How can, how can people who want to support you connect with you guys online? 
we're the Gatos Brothers. Um, we do business as Gatos Bros. Uh, Google search will turn will turn up a few a few good hits for us. They're at the top of the search rankings. But the petition on change.org is really is really the main thing right now that has uh, some information about what's happening. And it doesn't cost people anything more than a signature just to let the local government know that eyes are are on this, that the public that the public is aware and cares about what's happening. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate your time today and, and everything you're doing to stand up and, and not letting this injustice slide and, and not giving into it and really living by our values and, and saying, yeah, we're not we're not going to just let this we're not we're not just going to drive by and, and let this one slide. And I, I really do appreciate not just your time for me today, but the time that you have put into this. And, and you know, really, that's you know, that's what my heart breaks for. How much how much productive time has been lost that could have been making the world better for everyone with, with what you're developing that, that has now been robbed from humanity by this government corruption. It is, it is a, it is a tragedy, but uh, I, I hope you guys keep me updated. If, if, if there are any other, other developments, we see where this goes in the next, I don't know. I, what it's, it's one of those situations. At what point do you go, all right, I could be, I guess they're not coming after us now. 24 hours notice we could be out of here but maybe maybe they dropped it. <laughs> we've, you know, we've been living in suspended animation for a year and a half we we first received these stop work order notices on november 15th of 2018 and the that that notice said they would conduct a further comprehensive investigation within 14 days it took four months to even reach anyone at the county and over a year and a half later we're still we're still in administrative purgatory. So we can't say when this will be over, um, only that we're going to get through it. And if we're still here next time you make it out to California, we hope you'll come visit us and we can talk about a, a lot more interesting stuff happening. Our yeah. petition is uh, Save Gatos Gardens. We'll uh, send you a link when we sign off. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we have it for our producer. Uh, if, if, if Maybe we get that on the screen. It'll already be in the show notes. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys can come out here and visit us in Gardenia at some yeah. point as well and it's 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 worth pointing out for for all of us here and that this is not why we're doing what we're doing i we this is not <laughs> what we want like even this conversation yeah like, no. i want to talk to you guys about like engineering a way to move trees around and yes. you know yes. And, yes. and how to move water and, and collect yes. rain and and, so many grow more interesting food things. And, and feed people and, 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 and provide medicine to the world and, and to help everybody live a better life. And Let's instead, those conversations. Yeah. Let's make time yeah. for those conversations. That's what we would really like to get back to. Absolutely. All Thanks right. Again, Thank Adam. you very much, guys. Really appreciate it.